as a bit of an introduction, I've been at a few different energy storage conferences recently, three different energy storage conferences in different locations recently, um, where I've uh, given presentations generally about this project. Um, and energy storage conferences these days are basically lithium ion battery conferences. Um, that's really all that anybody talks about in terms of energy storage. So then when I get up and speak about this, about compressed air energy storage, I have a line of people trying to talk to me afterwards. And um, I just, I think that that's a perspective that people in, in this room should know about. You know, that everybody's really excited about this. People want to know about this outside, outside of this room. Um, people who are used to energy storage just in terms of lithium ion batteries. And um, now, is a, now is a really interesting time uh, to be building project number one and to be building it you know, just down the street. You know, this, is, this, is, this is the first one. So just a quick intro to EnerStore so you know where I'm coming from. So we are an energy storage project developer. We were founded in 2012, which uh, was well before energy storage was cool. Um, nobody was talking about energy storage at all, let alone lithium ion batteries back then, in terms of grid scale storage. To be a, everybody thought it was much too expensive. Lithium ion batteries belong in your pocket, in your cell phones, not, uh, not as resource on the electrical grid. I'll talk just a little bit about the different energy storage projects that we have. So we're actually a technology agnostic company. So we don't do just we don't do just compressed air. We actually have a wide portfolio of energy storage projects. We have our first commercial flywheel project in Canada, which is also just down the street in um, uh, Minto, in Harrison, uh, Ontario. It's a two megawatt project that's been operating since 2014 and uh, has been doing a really, um, really amazing job uh, performing regulation services for the, uh, for the, uh, the grid. And then we've also got our uh, fuel-free compressed air project, which is what this presentation is about. I'm gonna spend the most time talking about that. We've got a ton of behind the meter battery projects. So we do build lithium ion batteries. They're mostly, uh, most of our projects exist behind the meter, so these are for large commercial and industrial customers. Um, and then we've also got our, uh, our uh, we have the largest fleet of Tesla Powerwalls too in Canada, we're the, we're the distributor for the Tesla Powerwall. So quick explanation of energy storage and part of the reason why uh, as EnerStore, why we're kind of all across the board in terms of technologies. So energy storage, um, you know, a very, very brief explanation of how the, uh, how the grid is operated in terms of electricity. You've got your base load down at the bottom. You know, that's gonna be your nuclear plants here in Ontario. We don't have coal anymore, it's all nuclear. That's what, that's what all of our, uh, our base load is pretty much. And then we've got the, the blue bars there of uh, electricity from renewable resources. So that again, here is mostly wind. We've got some solar too. And then um, the orange line is meant to be the demand curve throughout the day. So the demand curve doesn't necessarily match up with your supply. So how do you make that work? Traditionally, it, it comes in the form of natural gas peaking plants. They would traditionally be the ones to fill that green space, that void there, um, and match whatever is produced to whatever is required for demand. Now, what we are working towards is instead of you know, wasting, curtailing this blue section here, that darker blue section, which is, you know, would, would be wasted energy, you know, in the middle of the night when there's uh, excess wind, we'll store that instead and, uh, and fill in these, uh, the, the green gaps there where there's not enough generation to fill the demand. Now, this graph off to the left here, that's a good example of compressed air energy storage. This is bulk energy storage. It's, it's working long, long-ish durations, um, large quantities of energy, a lot, a lot of energy as opposed to a lot of power. On the right here, that's, uh, that's what our flywheel facility does. So that's the, the type of energy storage that's just trying to control the frequency of the electrical grid. So it's really, really fast signals. It gets a signal every four seconds from the grid that comes directly from the grid operator to tell it to turn up, turn down, turn up, turn down, plus two megawatts, minus two megawatts, plus two megawatts, minus. It, it adjusts the frequency of the electrical grid to keep the lights at the same level 
You know, when you see the lights kind of dip down sometimes, that's because the frequency has dropped. So I'm actually not gonna to spend too much time talking about how compressed air energy storage works because uh, I, I noticed on the, uh, on the schedule that Matthew Davidson is speaking in the next block and he's talking, I read his abstract, he's talking a lot about how compressed air energy storage works. I'm not sure where you are out there, but I'm gonna leave that one to you. I'm gonna kind of move on and talk about uh, the learnings from this project and um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a, just a very quick overview, but I'm gonna focus more on the things that we've learned from building project number one. And this really is project number one. So this is the world's first fuel-free compressed air energy storage project that's operating commercially. So actually in the world, this is the first fuel-free compressed air energy storage project operating commercially. Like that's that's cool, <laughs> it's right down the street. And as soon as we get this thing operating in the summer, we're gonna do an open house. So watch out, watch out for uh, an announcement. You guys can co all come see it. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible accomplishment. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll talk very quickly just about the, the fuel-free part of it. So the fuel-free part of it, that's what is, uh, sets it apart from the other two compressed air energy storage projects that are operating commercially today. What we've probably, we've probably, um, you've probably heard about in uh, uh, Macintosh and in Huntorf. Those are the, the two fairly large compressed air energy storage projects that are operating. They, bo they both burn natural gas on expansion to warm the air. I'm not gonna go into that, I'll leave that to Matthew. Um, the, what makes ours unique is that instead of dumping the heat on compression, we store it in a thermal tank that's on the surface and then reintroduce that heat during expansion. So uh, super simple, just you take uh, you know, heat exchangers, uh, uh, liquid air heat exchangers, take the, take the heat out, store it in a, a big tank of water with some, um, uh, some thermal uh, antifreeze, thermal, thermal fluid in it. And, uh, and, then, and then reintroduce it on expansion. So that's what makes it fuel free and the way that we're able to do this without burning any natural gas. The rest of it's really straightforward. You just take air from the atmosphere, run it through a compressor, store that compressed, the, the cool it, store that cooled compressed air in the, in the cavern underground. And then when you want the electricity back on the grid, you let a little bit of that air out through a valve, run it through a turbine, heat it along the way, and then uh, you've, got your, you've got your generator to put electricity back on the grid. So this goes in a little bit more into how it can actually be fuel free. So this is, uh, you'll, you'll sometimes hear people talk about adiabatic versus diabatic compressed air energy storage. Diabatic just means that it, it, it burns fossil fuels, it burns natural gas. Adiabatic is this, this, this that means that it's, it's fuel free essentially. So where you, you heat the air with the, um, the saved heat from compression. So now I'll talk a little bit more about our project in particular that's, uh, that's just down the street. So this is, uh, it's 1.75 megawatts. So this is a, a teeny tiny compressed air energy storage project. But, um, you know, it's the first one. You gotta start somewhere, right? <laughs> so it's, it's 1.75 megawatts on discharge. On charge, it's just over two megawatts. It's about 2.1 megawatts on charge. And with four hours of storage. So that's where the seven megawatt hours comes from. So we were selected uh, by the Ontario IESO through a competitive RFP request for proposals um, to provide capacity using compressed air energy storage. And I, I, wanna, I just wanna dig into that really quickly here, because um, I also noticed that the next speaker, um, Alan, will be talking about the economics of compressed air energy storage. I, I did my research before this. Um, and uh, so I'm, I won't talk too much about the economics of this, but I do wanna point out that work pro we, the, the way that this project makes money is, is through two ways. Well, I guess technically three, through, through, two, we'll say through three ways. The first is through this capacity contract with the IESO. So IESO is uh, independent electricity system operator. That's the grid operator. They're the ones who turn the grid, uh, who turn power plants on and off, tell them to turn on and off to match the demand. They're the ones who actually do that demand equation. 
So they needed energy storage capacity. So we get paid at the end of the month a capacity payment for them for being available and following the set of rules in our contract. If you're really curious about what that looks like and about what our contract looks like and you want to learn about compressed air energy storage capacity contracts, it is publicly available on the IESO website. Um, it does not have any numbers in it, but the contract and the, um, the way that, this, that the facility gets paid is, is actually public on the website. So uh, we, we get paid through this capacity. We are also providing operating reserve for the, for the grid. So that's a, it's an ancillary service where you're, you provide, uh, where you're, it's essentially standby capacity. So if something were to go wrong with the grid, they, they're able to call on us to turn up and turn on and, uh, and replace anything that were to go off on the electrical grid. So, so that's called operating reserve. So those are really the two forms of revenue for this project. Notice I didn't say arbitrage. <laughs> Buy low, sell high. That's what everybody thinks about, right? When you, when you talk about, about energy storage on the electrical grid. Oh, well, you make money by you buy low and you sell high. Sure, we'll make a couple dollars a year doing that, but that's not gonna support the economics of a project. It needs to come through valuing the resiliency, through valuing what the energy storage can actually provide to the grid as opposed to just buy low, sell high. And there's the, the reason, it, it's, I, I'm not going to go into the details because I assume that Alan will, but um, it's, it, it has a lot to do with just with the, the electricity rate structure that exists in Ontario right now. It's not really, it's not possible to build a business case around that. So uh, we, were select, we selected supplier Hydrostore to deliver a turnkey compressed air facility on the Salt Cavern in Goddard. So Hydrostore is another Ontario company who uh, has invented a compressed air energy storage technology that's, uh, that's the one that we're building up in, up in Goddard right now. Um, the, the salt cavern is on a, a compass mineral salt cavern, and we're also partnering with the University of Waterloo. Uh, there are some researchers who, are, uh, who have helped us out with the cavern design, and they're also doing a, a big monitoring program on the cavern too to see how, uh, how the cavern um, changes or is affected or reacts to, over time to the, uh, the compressed air energy storage um, operations. Uh, since, this is, since this really is the first of its kind. So we're, we're still, uh, we're, actually, we're actually finished with construction now. So we're in our commissioning phase. So everything is, everything is there, it's all hooked up, all the electrical connections are done, we've got all our piping in place, all of our uh, thermal insulation is in place, it's all pretty much ready to go. We're just going through commissioning right now. And we're also continuing to take the, uh, make space for the compressed air in the cavern itself. So taking some more of the, of the brine out of that salt cavern to make space for the compressed air. So this is what it'll look like when it's finished. I'll show you some pictures of what it actually looks, right, looks like right now. But this is uh, after the, the site is all cleaned up and we've got grass growing again. Um, this is what we expect it to look like. So this is the view from the road. So if you're on the road in Goderich, if you look off to what the site looks like, it's like this. That's about the size of a, you know, a large garage. It's not a huge facility. Again, this is only 1.75 megawatts. And these are some actual photos for this, from the site the last time I was out there. So um, you can see our building there and the, and the photo that's over on the left. That building houses the compressor and expander equipment in there. The blue louver that's kind of sticking out the front of the building, that's the, the air intake. So that's where the air will go into the compressor. And then all of that piping that's off to the left there, that's all the heat exchangers. So the large horizontal pipes are the actual air, air liquid heat exchangers and then all of the support piping there. And then the big tanks that you can see kind of in the background on the picture on the right, those are the actual thermal tanks. And then this is inside the building. So the photo on the left it's, uh, is the actual compressor itself. So this right here, that's the actual uh, motor. So the electrical motor that will turn the compressor, air goes into this compressor. It's a five-stage compressor uh, with three different opportunities for heat exchange throughout that process. And then the compressed air goes down into the wellhead and is stored in the cavern. And then on the, uh, the right-hand side picture, this is the turbine. So when you want to generate electricity, you let little bits of air out. It goes through uh, this turbine right here. And uh, it's a three-stage turbine. 
and that'll then turn a generator which is in the foreground out of this picture. It's, it's hard, to, hard to get a good picture in that building. It's so full now. So talking a little bit about what we learned. Um, this, was, this was the hardest part about this project. It was just all of the unknown unknowns. Um, you know, like we, we knew that there were going to be a lot of these, building a first of its kind project, but um, you, know, you never know what the problems are going to be until you actually encounter them. Um, you know, we, we had lots of, lots of issues with contracting. Um, I shouldn't say lots. We had some, we had some issues with, uh, you know, with contracting because nobody knows what to do with this, right? Like this is a, it's a first of its kind project. How are you supposed to contract this? Um, same, with the, same with public outreach. You know, we, we tried to be really proactive with going out to the community in Gaurich before, before we broke ground, before, actually before we even got the contract, before we even won the RFP, we were out in Gaurich talking, um, talking to the local municipality about, um, about public outreach about this. And uh, you know, we tried to be really proactive, but it's still, I, I think everybody in this room probably experiences this. It's, it's, there's a little bit of, um, you know, mystery that goes into the, anything that happens in the underground and nobody really knows how to feel about it. You know, things like, things like this are hard to explain. You know, they're hard to see, they're hard to feel, they're hard to understand. Um, and I think that goes for everything that, that everyone here does as well. So public outreach was, uh, was definitely a challenge and I think we learned a lot about um, you know, how, to, how to present something like this, how to talk about it. Um, and, and what to do to get people comfortable with this new technology. And then same with permitting. You know, we had, uh, we had, I mean, I don't know, there are dozens of permits that you have to do for a project like this. Uh, and then each time we would go for a new project, uh, we would um, be encountered by, you want to permit what? <laughs> Like nobody had any idea what this was, so we had to we had to start from scratch on pretty much everything for permitting. Um, but uh, it was it, you know huge learnings along the way, and all of it was really an exercise in unknown unknowns from both sides, both from the people who were trying to give us the permit, and honestly, everybody worked with us really well on that. Big shout out to the MNRF who's here too. Um, you know, they, everybody worked really well, wanted to make something happen. It's just. Where do you start? How do you do this? So um, we're in a really good place for uh, you know, the next compressed air energy storage project that was going to happen, that, you know, that will happen. This is just the unknown, unknown quotes. I know I'm out of time, so I'll, uh, I'll finish this up quickly. You know, so this is the last slide. So what we learned, you know, innovation is very vocally supported outwardly, but it, it, is, it is difficult to execute from the inside. Um, you know, and, and that's a big part of the reason why you know, we're, still, we're still not finished with this, right? We're, we're, still, uh, we're still working through our commissioning process right now. It is, uh, it is, it is difficult to execute, but it's, it's, it's really rewarding once you get there. And we really are you know, blazing a trail and, and uh, you know, paving the way for whoever comes next um, with the next compressed air energy storage facility. You know, they require a very different approval path. You know, it requires a lot of creativity. It needs a lot of external support. So you need people, you need people actually supporting an, an, an innovative project like this and you know, not trying to hold it back. It's easy to hold back things that are unknown. And then uh, you know, fitting innovative projects into an existing box really doesn't work. You have, to, you have to be able to make your own box for this. And we need, you, need, you need regulators, you need people who are working with you to make those new boxes. And um, we, we feel like we've actually been able to get there, which has been awesome. All right, so that's it. Thanks, guys. Thank you.